Hello, my name is Ed Brown, Managing Director at the American Academy of Advanced Thinking and your host for Insights in Education. Today, I will be speaking with Denise Brosseau, a giant in the thought leadership arena. We'll be discussing seven steps for becoming a thought leader in education. Just to give us the background on Denise, she's CEO of Thought Leadership Lab, a boutique professional services firm where she works with trailblazers and change agents in education, nonprofits, and corporations, helping them increase their influence and impact for legacy building. Denise is also a lecturer at the Stanford Business School, and she speaks widely for companies, conferences, and communities across the U.S. She received her B.A. from Wellesley College and her M.B.A. from Stanford. In 2012, she was honored by the White House as a champion of change, and in 2014, her book, Ready to Be a Thought Leader, was published by Wiley Press. Welcome, Denise, to Insights in Education. Thank you, Ed. Nice to be here. So, Denise, let's just write into it. In your perspective, what is thought leadership? What is thought leadership? Such a good place to begin because I do feel like I've spent the last several years trying to recapture that phrase from, you know, that sense that anyone with a Twitter account is a thought leader, which is so far from my view of it. I mean, I really do think that thought leadership begins with people who are change agents, people who are in action and bringing about change in whatever arena they're playing in. It could be in their community, in their organization, in their company, in their region. But this idea that they are the go-to folks in that particular arena, that they are the trusted source, that they are the folks who, you know, they're the people that inspire us, the people that we turn to, but they are also those that are kind of showing us the way forward. They're people who are, you know, they have, they establish a point of view and they, they create this followership around that point of view or around the change that they have underway. Their goal, I mean, if, in the big, big sense, not everyone, but the goal is you know, really to join or create a movement around this change that they have underway. Now, obviously not everyone goes to that level, but this idea that we are in action and we're trying to bring others along to making that similar action more broadly. Does that make okay. sense? It makes a lot of sense. And it's curious, what inspires your work in the uh, field of thought leadership? Well, for me, it began with an accidental thought leadership journey of my own. And you know, I had the opportunity to start a nonprofit organization working with women who are growing high growth businesses, technology, life science companies. And the opportunity during a you know, big high growth period of entrepreneurship here in Silicon Valley gave me a bully pulpit to really be speaking across the United States and even internationally on what were the what was what was necessary for growing more women led businesses? What were the things that are holding women back from gaining access to venture capital and what were the opportunities that were possible and the work that we were doing, starting a venture conference for women entrepreneurs, starting a trade association for women entrepreneurs, being out sharing what was working in in our communities, the seven cities that I was working in, so that others could build on and adopt that. And then fast forward a few years, I got a call from a friend who said, you know, Denise, you became that thought leader in women's entrepreneurship. Will you help me do that? And and honestly, Ed, up until that moment, I never, ever thought of myself as a thought leader. You know, that's just not a term you put to yourself. Others right. call you that. But she hired me to help her in her arena, which was in uh, a company here in the in the Bay Area in workforce development, and we created a strategic plan, a five-year plan, and then we knocked it out of the park in three years that, that took her from being completely invisible in her arena to starting a groundbreaking program, scaling it across her industry, uh, recognized by the White House, testifying in the front of the Senate, head-hunted by the governor. And, and when I realized that we could do this with an actual strategy and a plan, I got really excited, and I wanted to get out and share what I learned. And I started working with others and created frameworks and developed a book around what I learned. Because if I look back at that young woman when I started my own organization and had this amazing opportunity to, to get, get a broader bully pulpit, I had no idea what I was doing back then, mm. to be honest. And so I kind of wanted to write about this. I wanted to write this book and share this to that younger person who wished that she'd had something like this. Now, I know you have a strong background education. Uh, how do you see college and university administrators viewing thought leadership at this stage of our development? Well, I think that the, 
phrase itself is still in question, and, and many people think that really only faculty can be thought leaders, and they really see that this, the research is what's necessary or the deep expertise in one particular vertical. But it's changing out there, and, and I hope that I'm try, trying to, I'm hoping that I'm part of that drive to change. You know, what we see in, in universities is that there are some specific roles where thought leadership comes more naturally. So I think about in my own backyard, here's Stanford, you know, the Center for Longevity. There's a, the, the head, even though that might be an administrative role to be the head of that center, that gives you a real opportunity to, to be distilling best practices and creating frameworks and creating, joining an ecosystem around these topics of longevity. That's a, a particular role. But then there are, I'm really looking at a lot of the changes that are happening on campuses now and understanding that, that college and university administrators can, can and should and are finding that they need to step into these, these broader roles as a, a spokesperson, a convener, a uh, pushing for legislation, et cetera, around big issues that are really impacting them, whether it's, whether it's you know, this push for free college, whether it's campus security, whether it's immigration. So we're seeing that administrators now are understanding that they're doing some unique things on their campuses and that those, there's learning there, that they would, once they can get together with others and share those best practices, they can start to gain a reputation for their university as well as for themselves in these unique ideas that they have, these practices that they're putting in place, and hopefully really having a, a broader impact to bring about essential change in some of these very important arenas. So I'm yep. actually very optimistic. Definitely um, education as a, across the board is going through a sea change of um, evolution as we speak. Uh, that being said, in your estimation, does thought leadership allow educators who are thought leaders to sidestep certain challenges experienced by non-thought leaders in education? I think the good news is that if you are perceived by others as that go-to person, as that person who is an effective change agent, someone that can think about broader change both within your own university and more broadly within a, an arena, that's the kind of person who gets promoted. That's the kind of person that gets hired. But that's also the kind of person that gets an invitation to the table, whether that table is with the media, whether it's a conference, whether it's at the legislative level, whether it's nationally on committees, commissions. Those folks, I mean, people are looking for folks who are willing to put their point of view out. They're looking for people who are willing to distill the best ideas. They're looking for people who are bold in sharing new perspectives, and that skill set is the skill set we hire for now. That, that's what I find. And so I think of thought leadership as career insurance. You know, if you really are that go-to person, people want you. <laughs> they want mm -hmm. to hire you for, for that skill set, but also potentially for the followership that you bring. So if you have a real uh, followership around a particular arena and a new entity is moving into that arena, whether it's campus security or whatever, now you're much more likely to be the person that they hired to lead that initiative somewhere else. Does that make sense? It does. I like, and I like your concept of career insurance. I think um, you should trademark that. I think that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that being said, if I am an educator, what's the process for me finding my thought leadership niche? It's an important question, and it's really where it all begins. The, the biggest challenge for many folks is that they are either generalists or they are unwilling to kind of put their stake in the ground around one arena. But I, my attitude and what I try to teach people uh, is that if you have a reputation in one arena, then go more broadly. But you need to have some sort of an umbrella that people can – can affiliate with you. And I think of it on the really tactical level as people know who to send you, what to invite you to, when to call you to weigh in. If you have a particular arena that you care deeply about, so it starts often with passion, but also where you're in action, making change, and where you want to see bigger change in the world. In other words, where you have a, a future you're working towards, hopefully that 
becomes your niche. And it's even better if you actually have some credibility. So what they call in advertising, those, those reasons to believe. Do you have some, uh, some background or some success in that arena? It could be credentials. It could be like a certification of some kind or a degree, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be that you built a program like this or you created change effectively in this other area uh, other role that you had or even in your existing role, that's what's going to allow you to be credible in that uh, arena or in that niche. And so I, I try to look at the intersection of sort of credentials, expertise, and passion and say the intersection of those is where I would look for my thought leadership niche. Okay, okay. One of the stories that we talked about uh, offline is the story of your, of your sister. Um, if you would, Please share the story of your sister going from subject matter expert to thought leader. Absolutely. Uh, my sister is a specialist and a professor in public health, and her specialty is around respirators. How can we keep bad things from going into our lungs to be really, really simplifying it? And for many years, she had worked uh, with a number of small businesses in the United States around these issues, whether it was preventing wood dust or asbestos, really became known as that person who understood this arena. So then, you know, fast forward a few years, uh, she sees a big uh, need for her knowledge at the national and even the international level when we started having SARS and Ebola at the forefront of the global challenges. And what was happening was the CDC and the NIH had put out some guidelines for healthcare workers, for nurses, and she, knowing from all of her deep research in this arena, that these guidelines were inadequate. They were not going to prevent the disease from spreading to healthcare workers. And she felt that she needed to now step onto a much bigger stage. So although she had served on committees and although she had been a professor and had worked at, uh, some, in some roles that were very much in her vertical, now she needed to, to take a public role advocating for change. And so she wrote, beginning with, she wrote a well-documented article on one of the, you know, the highest traffic blogs in her arena. And you know, we worked on that because I, I really wanted to assure that it wasn't just this very scientific language that she'd always written in, but actually was for the layperson, but also included calls to action, had a clear point of view, had, had, of course, documented the background and why she was the right person. But that, uh, that article became like the most read post that they'd ever had. And that hmm. led to all kinds of opportunities for her to serve actually on an advisory council to the president, to speak for the nurses and and work with them uh, and their unions on new guidelines. And eventually, those guidelines were actually changed. And that mm. really, really changed her perspective on this importance of, of being that public face and being that public voice for a cause or for something, you know, starting with expertise, starting with something she was passionate with, something she had the credentials for, but something that she also had a unique bully pulpit because – she has tenure, right? And as a tenured faculty, no one could stop her from speaking out against the administration. And the powers that be really were going in the wrong direction. And her work with others was, was the impetus to make that change. So, so much of this for me was working with her to change her mindset mm -hmm. and change. You know, she had the skill set, but she didn't have the mindset that allowed her to step out there. And that's what it became, that impetus was these global health challenges. That's the time when you must step up. And I think that often happens for people that, you know, we, we start with it, what's going on in our head and tell ourselves why we can't do it. And then something shifts, something happens. For me, you know, it was this opportunity to really weigh in on important issues when suddenly entrepreneurship was kind of a hot topic. That was my moment that I got the, the microphone. Those moments shift everything. And I, I want people to be ready for those moments. I want people to even find those moments so that they are out making change more effectively. I think that's a great segue into the next, my next question. In your book, Ready to Be a Thought Leader, How to Increase Your Influence, Impact, Impact and Success, you outline seven steps to becoming a thought leader. I want to do a deeper dive into three of the suggestions that you have in your book. Uh, building your ripples of influence, codify your lessons learned, put yourself on shout. Uh, could you speak to each of them directly, building your ripples of influence first? 
Sure. Uh, what I know about this journey from leader to thought leader is that it's really a journey from myself as an individual impacting the team that is following me, so it's sort of a one-to-many conversation, to what I call a many-to-many conversation, so even an others-to-others conversation. What do I mean by that? When you think about having followers as a leader, that's you impacting them directly. But when your followers have followers, that's when you really are starting to see change. So for me, ripples of influence is, is a, think of the visual of a, of a pebble falling into the pond and those ripples going out. You need people to be adopting your ideas and building on them. And then they go to their communities and amplify ideas. So what you're looking for in the ripples of influence step of the thought leadership journey is who are my champions? Who are my allies? Who are my followers? How can I empower them? How can I craft messages that they can adopt? How can I create frameworks that they can build on? How can I create a, a blueprint that they can follow? That to me is the journey. And what many people miss, and this is, goes to that next step, which is codify your lessons learned. What most people miss and what I missed in my own journey from leader to thought leader, is this importance of codifying things. So what do I mean by that? I mean is that it's one thing for me to go out and say, the three steps you need to take are A, B, and C. And that's what I've done, and that's what you should do. It's a whole other thing to create that those three steps or seven steps or whatever it is into a, a literally a visual framework. Mm-hmm. So what's well, it could be an infographic, but I always look back and think when we were in elementary school, we all learned that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you think about that visual framework. To me, that's the most perfect model for, for thought leadership is building frameworks that others can learn quickly, identify your point of view, identify what your, your path forward is. It could, of course, be you know a book, a guidebook, a, a blueprint, but it, it, when it includes these visual frameworks, that's the codifier lessons learned. And in that step is also about protecting those so that they become, as you said, I could I should trademark you know the career insurance, these phrases, the, mm-hmm. the, the taxonomy, the languaging that you're using, but also the the visual models and the, the actual steps. Those are things you can own and you can start to build as Maslow did, like create your own hierarchy that uh, others can build on. So that's the codify step. And most people skip it or, or under, undervalue it or, like me, don't really, I didn't really have the skill set to do that. I was more of a start, startup person. So really finding the people who love to do that process piece is critical. And then the last one that you talk about is just put yourself on shout. And, and what I mean by that is that we have to be out there. We have to be what I call discoverable, meaning if I go and Google your name or I go and Google your key ideas and I don't find you, mm-hmm. then or nobody knows, even if I can't find you online, if I'm out talking to 10 people about the arena that you're playing in, like I'm looking for a higher ed person who's a specialist in X and nobody comes up with your name, then you're not really a thought leader. Right, <laughs> and, you're right. not, and you're not doing your career any, any good. So staying under a bushel, which is often what our family tells us, our culture tells us, our community tells us, our organization tells us, is not an effective strategy. And it isn't going to bring about change. It isn't going to give you career insurance. So putting yourself on shout are all the models in which to take those frameworks, those blueprints, those ideas, and put them out broadly in the world. How can you create communities around your ideas? How can you convene and uh, shape an ecosystem around and join an ecosystem around what you're trying to do? So much of the work that many of us are doing is part of a broader story. So for myself, working in women's entrepreneurship, I'm in Silicon Valley, head down, working in my own nonprofit, and and then I some, I get a call one day from a national organization working on women's access to capital, and they convene a gathering of people just like me all across the United States, and suddenly I have a tribe, right? Suddenly I have a community of people who care deeply and are working and, and structuring best practices in all across the United States. And when we work together, we built out a, a vision of a future that was so much more energizing and powerful for all of us. So thinking to each of ourselves that once we put ourselves out on shout, now people can 
we are part of a, a larger ecosystem. If people can find us, we can find them, and that's part of that, that most, I think, one of the most important steps, too. Okay, okay. Uh, obviously, there are four more in your book. I want to encourage my listeners to go get the book, Ready to Be a Thought Leader, How to Increase Your Influence, Impact, and Success. Uh, I'm just curious, out of, of the seven, is there one in particular that you like the most? Well, I think that actually step four is probably the one I like best, and it, it's really about putting your eye on the line, I as in the letter I. And what, what I learned as I was doing my research for this book and as I work with my clients and as I go through my own journey and thought leadership, one of the hardest things is getting out of our heads, getting out of what I call, this one of my clients calls the itty-bitty shitty committee that shows up, right? And it says, you're not good enough, you're not expert enough, you don't have this perfect, you don't, you know, what all the, all those stories that we get told internally. And so that middle chapter of the book is, is all the, I, all the ideas I'm sharing in there are ideas about how I and others get out of our own way. Like, how do we stay on track? How do we, uh, so what are some of the ideas, for example, how do we find support? So, you know, building a, a mastermind team or creating a purse club or all these fun things that either I do or others that are my clients or people I interview do, that's what that chapter is about because we all get stuck. We all have reasons why we aren't going to do this, and that chapter is how to say, how to find new frameworks, and one of the best ones is saying, up until now, I did not do this, but now I will, right? And that's mm-hmm. leaving the past in the past. Don't make it the only truth. My new truth is that I will be in service to my community. I will make a difference for others, for example. And, and, and with that being said, what do you think holds people back from building a thought leadership strategy? Most people will tell you it's time, but, Ed, that's just really not the truth because this doesn't take a huge amount of time. More of it is that inner story, that inner story of perfection, that inner story of somebody else has already said this, the story of, you know, who am I, whatever it might be, and the getting beyond that and getting the, creating the support structures that are holding us accountable and giving us role models to keep moving forward, that's the critical element that shifts somebody from the I'm never going to do it or I'm going to do it once every, in a blue moon, I'm going to act like a thought leader to I really am taking a stand. And, and a lot of that is a mindset shift that says that this is not about being known, which is what people tend to shy away from, but I think it's about being known for making a difference. Mm-hmm. And for many of us, when we can get down to the down to the dirt about what we're doing this for and understanding that this isn't about our ego or building our brand or making us, you know, too big for our britches, whatever those, those things we're worried about, but instead about who am I standing for, what's the tribe or the cause that I care for, and who else cannot speak on, the, you know, we have many of us in the roles of the people that are listening on this podcast, we have a lot of credibility in our, in our world. We have a bully pulpit. We have the access to the microphone that many, many, many people around the world do not. And so mm-hmm. we, we can get into that role and that mindset that says we are doing this on their behalf, we often will get out of our own way. And that's, that's the critical shift, making it about them and not about us. Okay, okay. What are you working on these days? Well, I, I don't know whether I should have my head examined, but I'm working on my new book. <laughs> so okay. I said after the first one, I'm never going to do this again. But you know, the first book is The Journey from Leader to Thought Leader. But the new book is How Do We Create a Thought Leadership Culture? So how do you create the skill sets and the mindsets across an organization in order to both build more excellent skills within the leadership and the teams within our organization, but also to to tap that expertise we have deep within our organizations, give folks the kinds of influencer skills, communication skills, ability to to bring others along and build followership, which actually will help them do their day job, but also if we are 
sending them out in the community with a shared message, now we're building a reputation for our organization and we're far more likely to move more quickly in establishing our reputation for our organization as a thought leader. And so that's really what I'm exploring now. Like how do you do that? And and what are the seven steps there for organizations from initially where they either don't value thought leadership at all or they might have just their CEO out as that that person at the forefront, how do we think then about all the way to organizations that really get that they are part of a movement and that they are creating an ecosystem of folks sharing those same messages? That's the journey I'm really interested in now. Okay. And when do you expect the book to be completed? I have no idea. (laughs) Okay. I'm I'm still in the research phase, so I think I'm at least two years away. Okay. And, and, And we talk about tribe throughout our conversation, what's the best way for people to can contact with you, get in contact with you, as well as um, uh, stay abreast of when the book will be on the uh, release, as well as the, old, the older book? So the, the best, best way to, to find me is on my website, uh, which is thoughtleadershiplab.com. And my email is denise at thoughtleadershiplab.com. And all of my blog and my LinkedIn, all of those places, you'll find me on Twitter. These are all the platforms, but you know, the, main, the main spot is to find my website. Okay. Well, Denise, you have been, again, chock full of information. Um, thank you for coming on Insights and Education. Any final words for the good of the order? I guess my most important thing to to reiterate is thought leadership is not about being known. It's about being known for making a difference. And if I can encourage all of our listeners to to stay in that mindset and adopt the best practices of those who are in service to others, that's going to change the world, and that's what I want to see. Words live by. Thank you again, Denise. Uh, This is Ed Brown signing off on another episode of Insights in Education.